Okay, well, thank you all for coming here this morning. This is a, a continuing installment in the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. And today we're very honored to have Professor Subhash Mahajan from Arizona State University. He's a Regents Professor, a uh, very distinguished title at the University of Arizona. He is also an alumnus of the University of California from Berkeley uh, years ago. He got his undergraduate degree in India, Indian Institute of Technology in Bangalore, and then uh, went to Berkeley for his graduate degrees. Uh, he is an internationally recognized expert for his research on structural property relations and functional materials and deformation behavior of solids. Uh, which uh, I think he'll tell us a little about today. He's also a, a very prestigious member of the National Academy of Engineering and coordinates uh, editorship on one, two, three, four journals, if I'm correct, uh, which keeps him busy in his spare time. So today he's going to speak on self-assembly nanostructures uh, mixed in 3-5 and 3-N layers and their influences on devices. So with that, I'll turn you over to our distinguished uh, guest. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mahajan. Uh, thank you very much for hosting my visit and the lecture. And uh, it is my pleasure to come back uh, to the region where I started my career in this country after leaving India. And what I am going to ask you, how many of you have seen the movie Graduate? It came in 64, 65 time frame. Some of you were not even born. And if you recall, Dustin Hoffman finishes his undergraduate at Yale and goes to Los Angeles to meet with his future prospective father-in-law. And they are at a sw swimming pool party, and the father-in-law says, plastics. And the same thing happened. I had no father-in-law at Bell Labs, but uh, when I joined Bell Labs, my advisor or my department chair was Jack Wernick. He's no longer living. And he said semiconductors. I told him that I can barely spell metallurgy, and you are asking me to work on semiconductors. He said, you will realize how important uh, these materials are. So I am going to share with you my love affair with the semiconductors over the past decade, not decade, actually, three decades. So what I've decided to talk about is what happens in these materials, 3,5 like gallium arsenide or mixed like indium gallium arsenide or aluminum gallium arsenide, and then is the current And the, is, uh, the nitrides. Nitrides are fascinating materials. And they have tremendous applications in number of devices and all that. What I will talk about is how the material science can interface with electrical engineering and solid state materials and work as a team to solve difficult problems. And I'm associated, uh, you may see the word schools, because they have five schools in R.I. Fulton School of Engineering. I'm in the dean's office now. And uh, uh, see what, now give you a flavor of the applications of these materials or where they're used. First thing is the major application is in the light wave communication of these three five. Yeah, this is better. Look at the indium phosphide. It, it, we, we didn't create these materials, they exist in nature. And you can change the band gap of these indium phosphide the materials when you mix with gallium arsenide. The beauty is this remain lattice matched to this underlying substrate. So you can make light emission devices which will emit at 1.33 or 1.55. You can make detectors in these materials which will absorb at 1.55 and still lattice match. And these devices are used in light wave communication. 
you have a detector on one end, you have a generator, lightweight generation at one end, and then you use, connect them with glass fibers. And there are tremendous applications of these materials, the mixed three fibers, like indium gallium arsenide phosphide and indium gallium arsenide, and they are tremendous applications. And I usually ask my students, have you heard of light waves? Only few uh, people know about it. They use it every day. When you're making a call, you don't know on what mode the call is being sent. And now, and what I am going to address the issue is um, these, uh, these, that mixed three, five layers, the atoms are not distributed at random. And I explain the next slide, what do I mean? I'll cover the phase separation in this atomic ordering and then go to the mixed nitrides. And I'm going to finally show you these microstructures, which is the domain of material science and engineering, have a tremendous influence on the reliability of the devices, light emitting as well as the field effect transistors, and then give you summary and conclusion. Now, as an introduction, most of you have seen these structures. The mixed three, five layers crystallize in the zinc blend structure which consists of two interpenetrating face-centered cubics. Group three atoms reside on one sublattice, and the group five atoms reside on the second sublattice. These two sublattices are displaced, displaced from each other by quarter 111 in the 111 direction. So this is the structure. And as I said, I'll cover phase separation and atomic ordering. The issue is, when you make an alloy or mix two binaries to make ternaries and quaternaries to create materials with different band gaps, what happens to the distribution of species on the two sublattices? Rewording my statement is, suppose I want to grow indium gallium phosphide. I have indium and gallium on the sublattice of group three. Are these species randomly distributed or something else goes on? And I will show you, they are not. Of course, if they were randomly, I wouldn't be here consuming one of your hours. And so it, they are not randomly, and they face separate. And they atomically order, and they produce structures which no growth technique could produce. MBE, nanolithography, nothing can do that. Nature does it, and that's why I labeled it as self-assembled. Self-assembly to the metallurgist has been known forever. You take aluminum copper, you form aluminum, uh, you know, copper-rich precipitates in aluminum alloys. And what has happened is it has been fashioned into science by the word self-assemble. And we material scientists have known self-assembly for a long time. Now, just to give you the background, what is phase separation? Phase separation is you have a solid solution and that composition free energy diagram has inflection points and you cool that material. It doesn't get to these um, end members, but the solution decomposes into uh, A-rich region and B-rich regions. That's what we refer to phase separation in, in material science. It's in physics or material science. That's uh, uh, just introduction to the issue of phase separation. Now the next is you're going to look at how does phase separation manifest itself in the materials. You are looking at an indium gallium arsenide phosphide layers grown by liquid phase epitaxy. What do you see? And the growth was on 001 plane of indium phosphide. The composition that we used, we grew the materials of itself, emits at 1.3 three micrometer, that's the wavelength used by the lightweight communication systems. You look in the plan view, you image with the 2 to reflection, what you see is the speckle structure on a very, very fine scale. And the speckle structure has a wavelength, I'll tell you how we determine the wavelength, uh, about eight nanometer. Very, very fine scale structure. And then you see these coarse modulations 
you look at the same material with the reflection that is parallel to the growth direction. You don't see uh, any contrast very similar to that one. What is suggesting phase separation is two-dimensional in nature. It doesn't occur along the growth direction. But it occurs along the, this, there is an operating reflection, but it occurs along the soft direction lying in the growth plane. Uh, if you have this arrangement, the, those directions happens to be uh, 110 type. So what you conclude from these uh, two micrographs, we have fine scale speckle structure, wavelength we can determine. I'll show you in the next slide how we do it. And there is no phase separation along the growth direction. And you may ask, what is uh, uh, this dark contrast due to? When phase separation occurs, you produce biaxial strains at the interface. And that buckles your layer, the surface of the layer, and this dark contrast is due to that. Now, the next slide will show you how you determine the wavelength. This is uh, the electron diffraction pattern from the 0, 0, 001 position. Uh, and what you see is when you enlarge these two O spots, it is not circular. It has satellites, intensity around the Bragg position. And from the position of the satellite with respect to the Bragg spot, you can determine the wavelength. That Lipson did it in 49 in the Procroy sock paper, so you can apply the idea. So when phase separation occurs, you produce satellite intensity. And why you do that is the indium-rich regions have a larger lattice parameter than the gallium-rich regions. And that I'll demonstrate in the next slide, or argue in the next slide. So there is phase separation in these materials. And summing it up, phase separation occurs and is two-dimensional in nature in this indium gallium quaternary layers, occurs along the soft directions lying in the plane. There is no phase separation along the growth direction. And the wavelength that you see is out of the order of, uh, I will say, a point, uh, you know, 0.8 nanometer, the structure that is produced. Now, how do you, why does it occur? There are th strain-related uh, uh, reasons. This is stable due to polling. You look at the tetrahedral covalent radius of gallium and look at the covalent radius of indium. Indium atom has a much larger covalent uh, radius than the gallium atom. Materials, uh, these atoms are tetrahedrally coordinated in the zinc plane structure. Group 5 atom is connected to four group with three atoms. And the bond length that you have depends on the tetrahedral radius of the material. So indium to group five and gallium to group five bond lengths are different in the tetrahedral uh, tetra, tetrahedron or tetrahedra. As a result, there is a tremendous strain in the material. So what the material does is phase separate to avoid that, you can use the thermodynamic argument, but we use this argument to explain why phase separation occurs. Now, this is schematic illustration, what goes on the material. Uh, you are looking at the cross-section of the zinc blend lattice along the uh, 110 plane. These are the first layer is a group five atoms, right? And the second layer is uh, Third layer, you can look at group three atoms. Now, when you grow on this layer, you grow a bilayer. You grow a group five and group three together. You have to grow to, for the stability of the structure. The first layer is group five. You will attach group three layer here, and the atoms will phase separate, go into that position. Then if I have arsenic, you get group five layer, and the whole process goes on. So recapitulating what I showed you here, that if you have size differences between the species occupying a certain sublattice in 3 phi, the material is going to phase separate. There are no violations of that uh, idea. 
In, uh, in the case of indium gallium phosphide, same thing happens. Indium and the gallium phase separate for the same reason I described. And indium gallium arsenide does the same thing, and which I will show you. And phase separation occurs along the soft directions, lying in the growth plane. It's the reduction in strain energy that is the driving force for the occurrence of phase separation. Phase separation produces two dimensional strains in the layer, or two dimensional biaxial stresses that causes buckling and give you the, uh, the dark bands I showed you. Now, people used to argue that um, uh, LPE phase separation occurs because it's an equilibrium. Le LPE means liquid phase epitaxy because it's an equilibrium technique. We had to prove that uh, point that is not true. And it is, you, we then did the growth, MB growth of indium gallium arsenide on indium phosphide at different temperatures. Uh, for, uh, this is the reflections we are using, uh, that is uh, 400, 450, and 500. And you see the speckle structure in all of these uh, layers. And we can determine the wavelength from, again, the position of the satellites. And th those uh, results we can explain. But let me first give you the, the development, how the wavelength develops, how the amplitude develops in these materials. You can write a simple expression. The, the wavelength mod modulation wave wavelength is related to some constants, uh, A, surface diffusion coefficient, and T is the time we take to deposit a bilayer. Once the bilayer is deposited, the diffusion of atoms cannot occur. This is the assumption we made. And uh, you go for activation energy or self-diffusion, growth temperature, A and B are constants. So we measured the wavelengths of modulation from the diffraction patterns, then correlated with the, uh, and the fit is fair, you know, uh, not bad. What it is telling you, we can measure the activation energy from it is 0.25 EV, and that correlates the migration of arsenic on the surface of these layers. So we can correlate that. Now, does phase separate the question? Interesting question is you can keep studying physical metallurgy, you can study on semiconductor, but that does it have an effect on properties? We measured uh, the uh, carrier mobility in indium gallium arsenide, but you have to, how did we do this experiment? We grew indium gallium arsenide or the same composition at different growth temperatures. And if you recall uh, the phase separation concept I introduced, the higher the growth temperature, the composition difference between the end members is smaller. So, uh, if you measure the carrier mobility at, uh, uh, I say, room temperature, and you see this dependence, the higher the growth temperature you have of your indium gallium arsenide layers, the effect on the mobility is smaller. And if you measure uh, this um, uh, uh, at 77, you see that this mobility goes up, right? This mobility is lower, but the mobility goes up as you are growing at a higher temperature. Going back to the concept of phase separation and looking at the composition of the end members, you can rationalize. This is what we did. Uh, indium rich regions have a lower band gap. That's, uh, people have demonstrated it's acceptable. And the gallium rich regions have a higher band gap. In equilibrium, the carriers would like to stay in the low band gap regions. When you apply a field to measure mobility, the carriers have to overcome the barrier between the low band gap region and the high band gap, micro barriers. And that's how we explain a reduction in carrier mobility in the presence of phase separation. Now, how does the phase separation affect uh, the width of the um, photoluminescence peak? And that's what we did and shown here, just the opposite. Now you have indium-rich regions and gallium-rich regions in indium-gallium phosphide. So indium-rich regions have a lower band gap. 
gallium rich region is a hard band gap. So, when you measure photoluminescence, the peak width changes, the full, max, uh, full width half maximum width changes depending on the growth temperature. And that's what we tried to show you here that when you are growing at high temperature, the differences in composition between the two regions is much smaller as the width will be smaller, whereas you grow at low temperature, width is larger. So this whole picture is internally consistent that the occurrence of phase separation affects both optical properties and electronic properties of the layers. Life is not simple. In the same materials, what you observe is this is an indium phosphide, indium gallium arsenide phosphide, and indium phosphide heterostructure, which we grew by vapor phase epitaxy. The, the speckle structure is typical of the phase separation, and you have a 110 section. Uh, but in addition, what you see is the spots at half 111 position. So, what uh, you, uh, you see is it is occurring, the periodicity along the 111 direction gets doubled as a result of ordering. So, it is ordering coexisting with phase separation in these layers. Now, I'll explain later how ordering comes in, uh, but you see these spots, two sets of spots due to ordering. Ordering occurs on two of the 4111 planes. I don't think I have time to illustrate or explain why only or two, but I'll show you the ordered structure we have. This is a 110 section again, as uh, this is the growth direction. This is the, the coming out is a 110, this bar, uh, one bar 10. And the arrangement of the 111 planes in the zinc blend lattices, AA, BB, CC, just like the FCC lattice, but now you have two interpenetrating sublattices, you get AA, BB, and this structure. Uh, now, capital, this becomes a gallium rich layer. Then the next one is your group three, five. Then the next layer is the indium rich layer, and this repeats. And if you look at the periodicity along this direction uh, for this case, you will see it is double. So ordering occurs along the, on the 111 plane, only two of the four 111 planes. Now, how does the ordering occur? Mechanistically, the same argument, the size difference, helps you to understand that one. Uh, this is a section, cross section along the 110 plane, and this you have seen it earlier. Now, when you have two by uh, these uh, exposed arsenic atoms on the surface, group five atoms, as I said, there are a lot of dangling bonds on the surface. So to lower the electronic energy of the system, you form dimers, as shown here. And we have done valence force field calculation to illustrate. Uh, underneath the dimers, the arsenic bonds to arsenic to form a double bond, there is a compressive region, stress region. In between the dimers, you have tension region. And uh, uh, there's a compressive region and the tension region. Now, indium is much larger atom than the gallium atom. So what will happen is the gallium atoms will tend to segregate along this one more direction going into the plane. Indium regions will segregate along this direction. And of course, we don't observe experimentally, but the net effect is that when you do that and you grow the layer, you will see that you will produce the order, what is called the corporate platinum order, by the occurrence of this. Uh, I guess I should have reject, uh, gotten rid of it. It finally woke up. So it is stress-induced ordering. All material scientists 
familiar with it, the segregation of impurities to an edge dislocation, compression region and the tension region. And you can apply the same ideas and you will get this one. And if I take you to the next slide, why it is not moving. All right. So ordering occurs on the 111 planes. And it is stress-induced ordering because of the surface reconstruction. And the side difference is needed to selectively put atoms in certain sites. Uh, our conjecture is phase separation occurs first. And then there is a movement of atoms very short distances to produce order struct. We never get order parameter of 1. The best we could do was uh, 0.5, because it's very, time is too short to convert the phase separated structure into the ordered structure. And uh, that's what we observed. Now, does ordering have an influence on the electronic pro optical properties? What we are looking, this is not our work. This is uh, Japanese work, Gomio and Suzuki from uh, NTT. They, they grew gallium phosphide by liquid phase epitaxy, which is, there is no reconstruction in the case of LPE. Then they grew gallium indium phosphide by MOCVD, 3, 5, 5, 3 ratio is this one, but they changed the growth temperature. What they observed is at a low temperature uh, growth, the band gap is, doesn't change very much. As you lower the growth, uh, increase the growth temperature, you reach a minimum in the band gap, and then grow high temperature, then again goes back. The idea is here the temperature is too low to reorder the atoms. There is an optimal value where you can get the maximum order, and then when you grow at higher temperature, you get defective order. So phase separation changes, not phase separation, atomic ordering lowers the band gap of material. There is a story Phillips used to make these lasers for um, disc players. And they did not understand the growth, the atomic ordering is very sensitive, uh, or the band gap is very sensitive to atomic ordering. So they used to get fluctuation in the lasers that they were developing. So finally, what they did, they went away from the exact orientation and killed atomic ordering, and they were able to produce lasers with a consistent uh, wavelength. Now, you can also produce uh, triple period super lattices in these materials by changing the reconstruction. Earlier one, I was talking about two by four, but you change the reconstruction to four by two. Reconstruction, you know, it's, um, we don't learn much in material science, but uh, applied physics, they play a major role. But it's a simple concept. The atoms on the surface behave differently from atoms in the bulk. So you have a reconstruction, you, and you can produce these reconstruction by changing three, five ratios in your growth system. And what you find is now the, you have two mm, super lattice, I mean, you have a triple period super lattice. This is the Bragg spot, super lattice spot, super lattice spot back to Bragg, Bragg spot. So the period now is a triple period instead of the double in the earlier case. And that's what is shown here. And, uh, and the streaking of the super lattice spot is due to the imperfection in your ordered structure. They are very thin platelets. It's not a very good ordered structure. And that's what do you do. Now, how do you explain uh, the evolution of this order structure is shown here. When you have four by two reconstruction, uh, this is the structure that you should focus on. You have a reconstruction that produces a compressive stress. This is a tensile stress, compressive stress, and tensile stress. So in the earlier case was compression, tension, compression, tension. Now you have compression, tension, tension, compression, and 
changes the order structure, and that's what uh, is shown here. So we can explain uh, why these uh, order structures occur related to the stresses induced by surface reconstruction. Two by four leads to a double period superlattice, and four by two leads to a triple period, but you have to have size difference in the atomic species of your materials. Now, shifting gear, coming to the group three nitride materials, and you will see conceptually they are very similar. Crystal structure is different. Now these materials crystallize in the woodsitic structure, and that's what I've tried to show you. And the nitrogen, you can choose blue or uh, yellow color. These are group three atoms, and these are group five atoms. What is the difference between woodsitic and the diamond cube? The sublattices are made up of SCP units. So they consist of two SCP units shifted just like in the case of diamond cubic. And of course, group three atoms reside on one sublattice, and group five nitrogen is the one. Why these are important? The blue DVDs you have, they may, are made out of blue lasers based on such materials. And of course, the limit is uh, uh, um, the application are very unlimited for this material, They're always to give challenge to our students. If we, uh, I tell them, if they can dope aluminum nitride, p time, they can produce electronic devices that, which will work at 1,000 degrees centigrade, 1,000 degrees. You can monitor the jet engines, you can monitor the oil wells, you can monitor the blast furnaces, anything you want to monitor. And the silicon devices at the moment can go only to 120. The reason is thermal noise kills you the device. But since the band gap is very large, you can make them. And these potentials haven't been explored. They are it. now. Uh, so these blue uh, DVDs, lasers, or LEDs that you see are based on indium gallium nitride. And you can change the composition of indium, and it will change the emission wavelength. When you are below a certain value, and look at 3% of indium, what you see is your spots, the diffraction spots are spherical. You go to 12%, 22 in this case, Spots are no longer spherical, and they have satellites. And as I said earlier, from the position of the satellites, you can determine the wavelength of the modulation in the, these materials. We have done over a range of composition these studies. Luckily, we have a growth system of ourselves. Otherwise, it's very difficult to uh, do these studies. When I joined ASU in 97, I made sure we had a growth system to ourselves in the materials program or materials department. And when you grow, have a small fraction of indium, the wavelength along these directions, that's along which direction the uh, phase separation occurs, is infinity. Means there is no phase separation. What increase the composition, and you look at it, uh, uh, the wavelength decreases as the indium content increases. And that's the formula we use to determine the wavelength. And the reason is the driving force for phase separation will increase as you increase the indium content in your layer. And uh, uh, that's what is illustrated here. And also, I should point out, we are growing these layer on 0, 0, 0, 001 of the, is the basal plane of the Wurzetic structure, which is equivalent to a 1, 1, 1 plane of the zinc blend structure. What do you see in the microstructures? 3%, if you have a standard, those who are familiar with the microstructure, there are no modulations present in this structure. But look at, at in this case, is 12%. You see speckle structure, you see the stripe structure, and you see the boundaries. So there are three features I need to explain what the stripe structure is, what the speckle structure is, why do you have the boundaries? So when you grow on 001, 
what we showed is the phase separation occurs along 1 bar 1 o o or 1 1 2 bar o direction. There are three directions of each in the basal plane. If phase separation occurs along one direction and then neighboring regions that occur along another vector, you will produce the boundaries. We do not fully understand the structure of these boundaries, but we can rationalize. This is speckle structure, which I said is due to phase separation. And what is the correlation with this one and this phase separation? I will try to illustrate uh, in the next slide. This layer was grown at a much higher growth rate. There was a reason why we did that. We will try to understand why these re they, they are ordered. And uh, you see the, in, the dark stripes are indium rich. I have, we haven't proven. Dark stripes are indium rich regions and the light stripes are the gallium rich regions. And if you look at it, uh, the volume fraction fits very well. And also look at the crystallography. These, the directions normal to these stripes tend to lie along one of these directions. So, oh, so this is uh, Alex 100 nanometers, so it must be 10 nanometers. Very, very narrow. What is the correlation between the speckle structure shown here, stripe structure shown here? Our hypothesis is the stripes form first when the material phase separates and then it decomposes into the speckle structure. This is just a hypothesis. We have not proven that is true. This is the structure we were not trying to grow, but we were trying to study phase separation in aluminum gallium nitride. And what you get is this in the vertical alignment of the phase separation, vertical modulations. And the way it is, dark con contra change, this is the light region, the indium uh, gallium rich, and the, uh, the dark regions are the aluminum rich. And they line up in the vertical direction. We were puzzled. Why this happens in these materials? You can see, when I give you an explanation why this happens, is uh, by manipulating the growth conditions, I would be able to change the period along these directions and the extent of uh, these modulations is shown here. You start growing aluminum gallium nitride on aluminum nitride sapphire. This is a sapphire substrate. This is the buffer layer you grow on it. And we showed that these layers phase separate. The aluminum rich regions wet the underlying aluminum nitride, but the gallium rich regions do not wet. And that is, I think, that is what is illustrated. Their, their structure is shown here. This is. You now deposit on these. There is an asymmetry in wetting behavior A on B or B on A. And you see this wets this one. You get this structure and you start growing. And this is. And when you remove the interface between a rich regions, this dashed here, you can explain the evolution of the structure. I can change the modulations here by changing my growth conditions and composition. And then you can see the extent of the aluminum rich regions and the gallium rich regions in the modulated structure. We have not measured the electronic properties. Along the growth direction, and parallel to the uh, normal to the growth direction. That is a challenging problem to have. So, this one MBE. Yeah. You, uh, LPE of aluminum alloys are very difficult, as you know. This is MBE. Uh, and why does alum, uh, al you know, if you go back in history, aluminum gallium arsenide does not phase separate. But aluminum behaves 2 percent smaller than gallium in the case of nitride. I am not going to present any explanation when Alex is sitting here why that happens. And, uh, but this is a fact. Aluminum nitride lattice parameter is smaller than gallium nitride. So aluminum is behaving differently in the nitride than it does in the arsenide. And that leads to phase separation. The two two percent size difference. You do not see phase separation in aluminum gallium arsenide. There are examples given, but they are unreliable. 
Now, just like the 3, 5, the nitrides also order. And the, the ordering is you get extra spot at the 0, 0, 1 position. In the woodsetic structure, in the refraction pattern, you should not see a 0, 0, 1 spot. And you see them and the, at the, in indium gallium nitride. Again, the periodicity along the growth direction gets doubled as a result of order in these materials, you see. Uh, and the intensity depends on the growth rate. Uh, and the, the conclusion, I think I can't develop on that because of time, of cons uh, time constraint. You see the same thing in aluminum gallium nitride. You get the spots and diffuse intensity along the 0, 0, 1 spot. You see that. You get the ordering on that in those. Uh, now. What's the mechanism? I, I will uh, preface my remarks, we don't understand. And I'm going to speculate on the base of the model Northrop developed. This is the arrangement of, plausible arrangement of atoms in a random alloy. What happens in the ordered alloy is you get uh, gallium, nitrogen, indium, nitrogen, gallium, and the periodicity gets doubled. And why does it do that? According to Northrop, they, if you look at the 10 uh, uh, bar 1, 1 facets, as shown here, they are prefer sites for the attachment of B2 or the prefer site for the attachment of gallium atoms. And the T1 site is a, um, for prefer site for the attachment of indium atoms. There are reasons for it. You can see that it can continue. Uh, and is there evidence? Some evidence we have, but it is not clear cut that indeed uh, that happens. And that's the issue is there, phase separation and atomic ordering do occur, but we don't fully understand the mechanism by which ordering occurs in these materials. Now, uh, our present calls this use-inspired use research. I call it relevant basic research. All these, what I have, do they have relevance to real devices or not? What you are looking at is those people who are my vintage are familiar with dark line defects in uh, gallium arsenide based lasers. If you look at the active region of the device, you don't see these dark regions. This is 70 to 73 time frame. But with the operation of the laser, you develop these dark lines, they like, um, don't worry about the dark spot defects that's shown here that due to the indiffusion of metal uh, into the layers, but these are the important ones, the dark line. What happens is the device dies. They develop these uh, dark lines into the structure, the, into the active layer of the device, and it dies. Uh, now look at those dark lines. And what you see is those who do dislocation theory will be enamored. This is what dislocation in the layer. It multiplies, highly crinkle, showing that climb is occurring in these materials, uh, in, uh, in the development of the dark line defects. And this is another dislocation multiplies. Already tells you if you want to make reliable lasers, you better get re reduce the dislocation density to minimum in your material. Now the structure, these are the dipole structures. How do they evolve? And we had argued, and p other people had argued, that this is it's a tongue twister, what I'm going to say, non-radiative recombination enhanced glide and climb. When electron hole pairs combine very close to the dislocation, it doesn't emit a light photon. Your photons don't come out. But that energy gets coupled to the dislocation in the presence of stress. The dislocations climb and glide. That, that is the non ready very, very interesting work one can do. When you creep these materials and you shine light simultaneously, do you see all these effects? There was some evidence in cat telluride that you do. And now, those who study mechanical properties, if you have phase separation, right, dislocations are not going to move. 
you can argue which model, but uh, the shear model I of the two regions, indium rich regions and gallium rich regions are going to differ. So the presence of phase separation will retard the multiplication of dislocation. And next few slides I'll argue the presence of ordering will retard the climb of dislocation. Yes. So what you have, if you take the extra half plane uh, uh, of an edge dislocation in indium gallium arsenide, this is ordered. You see the dislocation terminates along the nitrogen, uh, I mean MN terminates in the group five according to that. Now if you want to preserve the order in the material, the atoms have to come in a certain way, in a, reach the dislocation core in a certain way. This has to come, uh, this was uh, indium, let's say indium, indium, and then arsenic. You can't put gallium or you can't put nitrous in there. And you, obviously you can see, being a statistical process, you can't do that. So the presence of order in the material will retard the climb of dislocation. The presence of phase separation will retard the multiplication of dislocation. So what it tells you, if you are worried about, um, if you are dealing with light emitting devices, which degrade by the multiplication of dislocation, these things can't happen easily. You will prolong the life of your devices. And that's what you observe. Indium gallium arsenide phosphide on indium phosphide, even though it's more defective, is phase separated. It has a much longer life than the gallium arsenide based devices, which are more perfect because they're not phase separated. Now, uh, now suppose I want to make a field effect transistor based on the indium gallium arsenide layer. It phase separates, it reduces the mobility. So you, it will, you can make much faster devices if you can prevent the phase separation. What, um, certainly I have tried to argue, or not so certainly, that you have to tailor the microstructure of your active layer uh, to get the right conditions for your device. And this is, uh, I think those who deal with structure property relations, mechanical properties, you tailor the microstructure to get certain properties. You tailor the microstructure to get um, magnetic property. You tailor the microstructure to get superconducting. What I have shown you here, you must tailor your microstructure to get the optimal behavior of a device. Doesn't apply to a binary or a, you know, silicon germanium because they contain only one type of atoms. But in the case of compound semiconductors, the nitride, the microstructure of the mixed layers become very important. And their coupling between the materials people and the electronics or solid state materials becomes very important. And uh, with my summary, what I showed you is when you have atomic species which differ in their tetrahedral radii and you make a binary, ternary out of a binary, you are going to phase separate your material and you are also going to order, atomically order your material. And two types of phase separation. And I also argue that the, these two features, microstructural features affect the electronic properties of your material. And then, and I believe this conclusion, uh, probably for the first time anybody has argued that you must tailor the microstructure of a layer. You can't treat a layer as a black box. You need to understand what is in it, and uh, you can get optimal performance by tailoring those. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Time for a question or two? Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, that's a great talk. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I have a question about this uh, electronic uh, properties in this, I mean, related to this phase separation. Can you explain that uh, actually based on the mobility change when the electron uh, crosses the 
for example, gallium rich and poor faces and band gap changes and all that. Yeah. But I wasn't quite sure it can be explained by only mobility because I suspect that the, at the interface there between stretch. poor rich, uh, there, there must be band bending. Oh, yeah. I, what I said, you have uh, uh, interfaces and there are micro interfaces and yeah, no, the, the I mean, con concentration effect has to be taken into account as well. The, the band gap argument yeah. takes care of the concentration yeah, effect. That's, that's what yeah. Yeah. So we did. Oh. Okay. All right. Th that you. was not our original. There was a, an article in 1984 in PR, uh, Physical Review B, uh, blood is blood than somebody else, where they argued you get uh, compositional differences, you get co and then different band gaps. And then you have created a heteroband, a hetero interface. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so the mobility de degradation is, is a scattering effect from the variation of the tension or the different yeah. regions? Yeah. Yeah. You can call it scattering effects. I call these uh, heterobands. And you, know, you have to cross them uh, to move the carriers from one region to the other, the next one, to get to the end. Yeah. How large is the variation in composition? composition. There is only one measurement done uh, at Oxford. They have atom probe, they, uh, and they did work on indium gallium arsenide, plus minus seven percent between indium rich regime and the gallium rich. We are now working with them on the nitrides. What composition differences we are getting? Yeah. And what is, um, I didn't pose that question is, I argued that it's two dimensional, right? How do they stack up in the vertical direction, the layers? And hopefully that answer will come when we do three dimensional atom probe. The microscopy can't give you that answer. Atom probe is becoming very powerful technique. Uh, we would like to acquire one of those at uh, ASU because we have 12 microscopes, but you know, <laughs> we don't have a single atom probe. The next uh, faculty line should go to the atom probe. Your naming was right, but um, you know, the ideal scale discussion was the um, fact that the dislocation of line, which is limited by phase separation, and dislocation of line, which is limited by volume, still continues. Oh, I mean, there are no direct evidence. This is the arguments I have developed to explain. I've been saying because yeah. the size and activity of the line process will be retarded because of the specificity yeah. of the position yeah. required. If you don't do that, you introduce domain boundaries, right? Climb and use the main boundaries. It is, you know, as I call my love affair with the semiconductors for the last three, I learned a lot uh, as I was going through. And I could bring what I learned in material science to the semiconductor science in terms of dislocation effects. Yeah, of the transition between the affirmation to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Bell Labs forced it on us. As I said, uh, semiconductors, Subhash, that's where the action is. <laughs> Have you looked at uh, silicon germanium? You get yeah. ordered? You do. I didn't, but IBM did. Yeah, same order structure. Uh, copper platinum. Uh, Francois Lagousse's work. Yeah, the same order structure you see. Thank you very much. Very impressive.